Locations. Battlefield. The site was not much to behold, even on a sunny day, yet it was here that several years earlier a bloody battle had ended in a magical cataclysm. Rocky gullies opened into a pl onto a plain scarred with furrows and craters, docked by trebucate missiles and magical explosions detonated by the sorceress Sabrina Glevisic. Tall reddish glass cu no, tall reddish grass covered part of the flatland, and rustling armor and bleached bones of the fallen nestled among it. Once the curse was activated, however, a ghastly mist engulfed the section of the battlefield. Within it stretched a world seemingly pulled from a nightmare, a world in which ghosts of the fallen endlessly reenacted the battle that had claimed their lives. Kedwani Camp The Kedwani military camp greeted us from afar with a cacophony of sounds typical of such encampments. Officers' commands and sentries' shouts mixed with the growling of platoon leaders and lightning enlisted men as to their mother's professions and why these ladies charged so little for their services. Veterans cursed, recruits sniveled, the horse giggled, horses neighed, and dogs barked. The din was accompanied by a jumble of, spe of smells. The stench of several thousand men who consider guard duty in the rain to be an adequate bath cannot be mistaken for any other, and this blended with the sense of boiling cabbage, foot wraps, and stables. Compared to the noxious odor the wind carried from the camp latrines on sunny day from the camp latrines on sunny days, the smell of the Karen's lair seemed like that of a flowering meadow. Characters Cedric Heroism sometimes exacts the highest price. When Trist's life was in danger, the elf did not hesitate to defend her and was wounded, mortally, as it turned out. Thus Cedric died, though his sacrifice was not in vain. Arnold. Um, supposedly involved in commercial dealings with Bernard Lorido, this man was a frequent guest at the Commandant's abode. In point of fact, Arnold was an agent serving the Kingdom of Kedwen, which sought to annex the trading post so as to take control of the trade road upon which it lay. Unfortunately, mortality rates are terrifyingly high among spies who are captured and then prove uncooperative. Arnold failed to survive his interrogation, and so this living proof of Kedwani's scheming was history. That's the one I wasn't supposed to kill, isn't it? Margot had been a spy for Yorveth. Fearing this would come to light after the elven commander was captured, she took her life. Dere. Or Dere. The elven girl at the brothel in Flotsam was a favorite of many clients of Margot and of Margot herself. As it turned out, female inquisitiveness has its merits. In telling her story, DeRay provi provided us with some valuable information. Marietta Lorido. Having met the commandant of Flotsam Town Watch, I did not expect his mother to be a charming old lady, always prepared to treat her guests to fruit tarts. Yet Geralt's experience with the hag destroyed any illusions I may have still harbored regarding Lorido's family. Marietta proved to be a drug adult creature living in her own world of madness and hatred. Thus, I think it may be for the better that she no longer that she is no longer among the living. Moral At times a man is left to wonder whether there are any limits to depravity in this world. The elf woman Moral had disappeared from the plot so many months before and was found in the tower of in Commandant Lorido's house. At the mercy of the degenerate and his mad mother, beaten and abused, she was but the pale shadow of a once proud and shade. As long as she was with child, the elf had a purpose, a goal to live for. Yet as soon as the child was born, she t the tormented Moral decided to end her life and opened her veins. Thus her tragic story came to an end. Civic Though the generals and marshals are the ones to earn the laurels and honors from glorious battles, victorious campaigns and successful wars, the core of every army is made up of simple soldiers and non-commissioned officers. Lance Corporal Civic of the Bhutan Banner was the best example. Like any good soldier, he was no philosopher and did not question his superior's orders, yet ruled his subordinates with an iron fist at the same time. His combat experience and years of practice had taught him a few key rules. One sleeps whenever possible and rises whenever awoken. Drinking on duty should be discreet and restrained, and a mouthful of booze must always be left for the superior officer. And finally, while on the march, women should only re be raped when nobody's watching. 
utter that a sense of extreme pride in duties fulfilled, a trait so characteristic of a career soldier, and you get, my dear readers, a portrait of the model Cadwani veteran. Odrin. To say that Odrin was not shy about drinking is like saying that Yorvath was not shy about shooting humans. Such was his reputation as a drunkard that wherever moonshine could be smelt in Hensel's camp, one assumed that Odrin could not be far off. La Sota. When it turned out that the breakup letter from his beloved had just been a bad joke, La Sota proved to be a really helpful person. As the quartermaster's assistant, he had ac access to both armor and weapons, obviously for a price. Isidore Quay. Whether it was building fortification or so constructing clever traps, dwarven technical skills had no equals and I Isidore Quay could use them, use them well. The mercenary made money on the side, running a small stall in the royal camp. Magnus. Every military camp use has uses for a blacksmith, from shoeing horses to making and repairing weapons, to freeing the wounded from warped armor after a battle. Magnus was a reliable artisan, a huge man with the strength of a bull. Rumor had it that his grip was not unlike that of iron pincers. Relic seller. Business, as a certain halfling would say, must keep rolling, and nearly anything can facilitate this. Wondrous amulets, invisible invisibility caps and pornographic scenes carved in cedar wood always sold well on market days, during fairs and in military camps. Benefiting from the popularity of Sabrina's cult, a certain enterprising man had begun selling relics from the site of her execution. The demand for protective amulets always grows before a battle, so this individual did not lack for customers. Letant Ave or oh, Abbot, I did not remember, did not enter tournaments to prove himself, but to maim and kill. Above all, he cherished those moments when he had crushed an enemy and could mercilessly pound him into the bloody mud. Called the Butcher of Sidaris, he owed this moniker to his infamous role in a tournament a few years earlier that was interrupted before time, but still ended with a trifling fire of death. After those events, Abbot chose to accept the hospitality of King Hanselt, Henselt, known for his less strict approach to, co to the concept of chivalrous rivalry. In the arena, the butcher of Sidaris faced Geralt, who proved that he had not been dubbed the butcher of Blaviken without reason. The first butcher was butchered by the second. Thus ended Letan Davé's bloody career. Manfred. A father's care for his son, even an adult son, can cause even the bravest to grieve and worry. Manfred was an old soldier, a Kedwani veteran of many battles who had lived a full life. Yet the thought of outliving his son, who was to face the terrifying butcher of Sidaris in the arena, had broken the brave man. Manfred tried to drown his sadness in despair in booze in the camp canteen. After his son emerged from the arena victorious, Manfred rewarded Geralt. He was extremely helpful to the witcher, proving himself a man of honor. Sven. Fate would have it that a youth named Sven was to represent his unit in a duel with the famous butcher of Sidaris. Since Sven's heart was full of valor, he was not about to back down, though the chances were slim that he would survive the fight with his empty head still attached to his shoulders. I will tell you soon how the story ended. Fighting side by side, Geralt and Sven emerged from the duel victorious, defeating two exquisite swordsmen. In recognition of the, youngst of the youth's valor and skills, King Hensel knighted him, and Geralt gained several valuable allies in the Kedwani camp. Samba Geralt was surprised to learn that Samba was also a skillful barber. For a fistful of orange, the trader would work with the witch's mane. Edwin Lystam Nightly eccentricities such as speaking in rhymes or offering ladies feathers from the helmets of one's vanquished foes are classic lore of classical origin. Edwin Lystam earned the moniker of Petal by putting flower petals into the mouths of slain enemies. These eccentricities, however, worked on the females. At the sight of such knights, maidens from Buina to Yerugo rain ran towards them so fast that if they were, were to be laden with bales of hay, the hay would immediately catch fire. As a result of this epic clash, Edwin Lyson fell to the blood-soaked ground, and there was scarcely a breath in him as he was carried from the field. That's evidence, dear readers, that if one's substance does not equal one's style, it's better to devote more time to training than picking flowers. Vincent Trout The owner of Sir Kirk's armor was an officer in Hensel's camp. Army 
excuse me, suspected as an accessory to the conspiracy against the King's life, Vincent Trout was hiding somewhere. Tris Marigold Tris was kidnapped by Letho. Geralt and I feared what he might do to her. Believe me, it was eating me alive, making rest impossible. Searching Sheila's quarters and talking to her neighbor brought some more questions than answers. It appeared that Tris had known the man she had talked to, but the fragment fragments of the conversation recounted to us were made mysterious. Tris had reached Eden. There was evidence to prove it. Finding her would prove difficult, however. Dandelion Obviously, when Geralt decided to continue his search in King Hensel's military camp, located in a borderland soon to be engulfed by the flames of war, I chose to accompany him. For the Witcher could, all, could at times be naive as a child and knew as much about politics as a ghoul knows about chip cooking. Thus the chances were slim that to none that, bereft of my help, he would manage to find new leads without getting embroiled in some trouble along the way. As his friend, I clearly could not allow that. Vernon Roach. It is hard to please men such as Roach. However, capturing Yorvath at the Blue Stripes commander practically beaming with joy. Vernon was a man of action. When he learned of Lorido's treason, he crafted a bold plan to remove him from office. Roach achieved his goal, getting rid of the black guard of the black guard Bernard R Lorido. The Blue Stripes captain did not forget the witch's help. From that moment on, Geralt and Vernon became allies through thick and thin. Shillard fits Asterlin. We met Schillard again in King Hensel's camp, which was not surprising, since Fitzösterlen always circled monarchs like an old vulture circles a carcass. The discussion he had with Geralt brought no hard facts, but a career listener sh could take more from the questions the imperial diplomat asked offhandedly than from the answers he offered the Witcher. He was interested in the situation in the north, the, si the sorceress and the summit in Loch Muin, as well as in seemingly unimportant trifles. Either way, I already suspected back then that he was playing a game of the highest stakes. Kingslayer. Letho had indeed been working with the squirrels, doing their wet work for them. Geralt would soon learn the answers to many more questions. In the ruins of the elven bath, Geralt and the mysterious assassin stood eye to eye a second time. Geralt was surprised by what he, had l what he learned. Letho of Galt had been a witcher. What is more, there were other Kingslayers, and they and Letho had worked together to assassinate the two dead northern monarchs. The Witcher and the Assassin were also no strangers. In fact, Geralt had once saved Letho's life. The discussion ended abruptly as arrows whistled through the air and swords clashed. Letho demonstrated his strength and skills by beating Geralt black and blue. Before leaving, he announced that he was on his way to Adan. The Kingslayer proved true to his word and kidnapped Triss, wounding Cedric mortally in the process. He forced the sorceress to aid him by teleporting them both to Adan. Yorveth. The elf was certainly a dangerous individual. He was not, however, a bloodthirsty monster. Ever cautious and aware of the game he was playing, he jumped at the chance of testing Letha's loyalty, becoming Geralt's ally, at least temporarily. We can safely assume that Yorvath long remembered both the wallop Geralt gave him and the witch's sudden turn, though the elf's pride probably hurt a lot more than his head. Zoltan Shive. The charges that Zoltan had contacts with the squirrels were not entirely baseless. Though he did not actively participate in military action, the dwarf knew he, the unit's leader, Yorvath, among others. It was not surprising, really, that having encountered the aforementioned human spite and ungratefulness at every step, Zoltan sympathized with the dwarven and elven freedom fighters. He was balanced in his views, however, and valued loyalty to old friends above all else. Though it was not exactly the Sultan's cup of tea to visit Hensel's camp, a place where non-humans were at best treated with mistrust and disdain, he decided to go with us. Yet he felt rotten, knowing nearby his kin were preparing to repel the same Kedwani we were, we were visiting. Bernard Lorido We did not learn the full measure of Bernard Lorido's corruption and twisted decadence until we found the elf woman he had kidnapped and imprisoned in his residence. She had been treated with exceptional cruelty. She had been beaten and raped. The man truly deserved no mercy. To this day, the people of Lotsam maintain that nothing less than a witcher could have rid them of the town's bestial self-appointed ruler, Commandant Bernard Lorido. Though he could not match their care and in size, he was without a doubt the greatest monster in the area. Many breathed a sigh of relief when the white-haired witcher sent him to the world beyond. Sheila de Tanserville 
It appears Sheila had very specific plans concerning the King Henseld of Cadwen and his attempts to fa father an heir. From what he we've been able to tell, the meddling of Sheila and her and other sorcerers in the world of politics was further reaching than anyone had imagined. Meeting Sheila in Hansel's camp came as a slight surprise. On the other hand, it was hard to ignore her arguments, and that the regicide could plunge the north into utter chaos, and she did not intend to let that happen. Sarit. Sometimes a person's name sinks into memory and brings fear to one's heart as its first at its first mention. Who was the mysterious Serit? What goals drove him and what role could he play? Geralt had yet to learn all of this. Orcs. When he first heard Orcs name the witch, I had no idea who this was. Ha! Huh, he did not have the slightest inkling of the role of this individual would play in our story. Henseld. The witcher once said that in his life he had met thieves who resembled city councillors, councillors who were like begging louts, harlots who behaved like princesses, princesses who smelled like pregnant cows and kings who looked like thieves. King Hansel did not look exactly like a thief, but with all due respect, he was not far off. He owed the resemblance only partly to his bearded countenance, beady eyes and wandering yet penetrating gaze. His annexation of Loma, called Afa Adan by its natives, at a time when Adan was fighting off the Nilfgaardian horde at its southern border, was also considered a theft. The now dead King Devmarven judged this deed severely and communicated this in curt yet resonant words. Yet that was not the sole reason for King Hansel's reputation as an unpleasant person, much bolstered by the monarch's ambition and quarrels with his neighbors, and by his ruthless policies towards non-humans whom he prosecuted with a passion, squandering this realm's strength and funds. The aging Hansel did not have a living heir, and the rumor was that he had found, pro found producing another son somewhat troublesome. Hansel's virility may have lessened with age, but his ambition certainly had not. The king wanted to wage a war and reclaim Lomark, a province he had already given up once, no matter the cost. The king reaped what it, that which his deeds had sown years earlier, when he and Nilfgaard jointly partitioned to Eden. Though he returned to stolen lands, there were many among the Kedweni who considered Hansel's assault on an ally to have been dishonorable. These men created a conspiracy against the corrupt leader, adding a new cause for concern to his pile of worries. Cadwan's king had been terribly cursed by the sorceress Sabrina Glevesic, whom he had condemned to death. Death Mold Apart from a few chance encounters at official da banquets, Geralt had the occasion to meet and speak more extensively with the sorcerer on Tanad Island, during the bloody coup when all manner of mages jumped at each other's throats and their council and conclave ceased to exist. Deathmold and his brother Dritthelm, both in the service of King Esterad of Kovir at the time, attempted to remain neutral as events unfolded. To no avail, however, as those who had allied themselves with Nilfgaard thought nothing of the impartiality of others, and many mages simply perished, brought down in fanciful ways by their colleague spells or pierced by the arrows of the Scoia tail summoned to the island by the plotters. Dritthelm met just as such a fate, while Deathmold saved his, uh, himself by fleeing. Deathmold then filled the opening for a sorcerer advisor at the court of King Henseld of Cadwen and proceeded to place all of his abilities at the monarch's disposal. All said and done, Deathmold was certainly a talented sorcerer. It was only his power that brought the king and his retinue safely through, the, through and out the mist of wraiths. Philippa Eilhart this was hardly the first time Geralt and I encountered Philippa Eilhart, jewel of the court at Tredegor, and once the trusted sorceress of King Visimir II. Philippa was one of the most talented mages of those times, only a handful ever mastered the art of polymorphy. Her intellect and the influence she held at the Redanian court were not to be underestimated. Proud, independent and extremely beautiful, as graceful and in a fanciful yet elegant dress as um, in a man's travelling outfit, she was beyond any doubt one of the most attractive women I've ever known. Yet I would not count Philippa among the most pleasant of females, despite her indisputably, indisputable tough, chilly charm. Her gaze alone was enough to make the most confident men shudder, and the mere thought of spending a night with her would make the flesh creep. Not only theirs. Saskia. Nothing drives a revolt forward like the right leader, especially one who is a young girl known for performing miraculous feats of valor on the battlefield. 
From Joan of the Arc Coast to the infamous Falka, history is full of women <laughs> who led fanatically devoted hosts to victory. Interestingly, all those heroines were not only charismatic but also extremely beautiful. The squint eyed, gap tooth, and pockmark generally have trouble arousing the masses. Saskia, whom men would follow into fire, was no exception. She was a smooth skinned lass with blonde hair, dark brows, large eyes, and shapely lips. Her full breasts perfectly complemented her rounded hips. In other words, she was the ideal icon for a rebellion. For, dear reader, if a man in battle receives the appropriate motivation in the form of a lovely female ass, he is likely to achieve miracles in its wake. When there is no such ass to lead the way, the freedom fighter's thoughts quickly turn to harvest time, his own woman, and a half pint of booze at the inn. News had already reached us of the heroic Saskia, the woman who held Kedwen's armies at bay. At the time, however, it all seemed like little more than exaggerated rumors. As with any true hero, there were many incredible tales about Saskia. Some claimed she was invulnerable to fire and had thus survived the terrible battle when Sabrina had rained the very flames that fell down upon the combat combatants. The girl was also famous for killing a dragon. One would be hard pressed to find better material for a local hero. Prince Dennis after King Demavent's death, Prince Stannis became heir to, Edernian to the Edernian throne, at least in name. However, pride and a chilly disposition rarely win the love of one's subjects, and that was very much Stannis' problem. His youth did not strengthen his claim either. Though no one openly questioned the prince's claim to the crown, Stannis did not have enough support to actually have it placed upon his head. Given the situation, sitting out important events would have been political suicide. The war for the Ponta Valley gave him the ideal chance to bolster his position by demonstrating what a good ruler would make. he would make. History was shown time and time again that when a realm is in chaos, deeds rather than words grant one's le one legitimacy in the eyes of one's subject. Stannis greatly desired to prove himself the equal or superior of the Virgin of Edom. He had strong support from the nobility, yet the common folk had few reasons to sympathize with him. He was not lucky enough to leave the ghastly battlefield in one piece. Thus, the Adanian throne was left without a legal heir. Yarp and Zigrin Our friendship with Yarp and Zigrin stretches back a long time. It began during the famed hunt for the Golden Dragon, which not only was not caught, <laughs> but also bet up its hunters. Those events were later described in one of my ballads, and anyone interested in the story should read it. Zigrin, like most of his kin, is characterized not only by his love of gold, but also by his bawdy sense of humor, sober outlook, pragmatism and loyalty to his friends. Geralt mentioned that he later met, met Yarpen and his lads in His Majesty's Secret Service, the Majesty in question being Hensled of, Hensled of Kedwen, for whom they were escorting secret cargo. Though their own situation was not cheerful at all, they nevertheless aided the, the, the Witcher, easily proving that a dwarf won't abandon a friend in need. Sabrina Glevesic The sorceress Sabrina Glevesic was from Art Karaik, the capital of Kedwen, and had been he King Hensel's advisor. The reader, however, should not be deceived by that term. This true daughter of the Kedweni wilderness was famous for her determination and temperament. There was no exaggeration to the rumors that on many occasions she would interrupt the king, thumping her fist on the table and yelling that he should shut up and listen. And the king would indeed shut up and listen. Sabrina Glavisic's predatory nature was paired with an equal predatory beauty, with equally predatory beauty which she emphasized through appropriately chosen attire. Add to that the power she commanded as a sorceress and it should become clear that she owed the strong position not only in Kedwin but also beyond its borders. This position could not protect her from the king's wrath, however, and when she failed Hansel one time too many, the sorceress ended up at the stake where her life ended. Sabrina cast a curse on the monarch and the battlefield with a dying breath. Many years later, we were to feel the effects of this malediction. Monsters Drog the Drog is a mythical creature, straight from ancient legends of heroes and epic deeds. When the hero enters the burning house to rescue his beloved, or when he has to avenge his father's death, the Drog is often its opponent. Why are poets so keen to cast this monster as the arch enemy? Well, the Drog is a wraith, so it fits any dark story featuring a curse or vengeance from beyond. There is no telling how... what it actually looks like. There is no telling how... 
No, there is no telling what it actually looks like, so its terrifying visage can be described in many ways without risking accusation or confabulation. Furthermore, it is a powerful creature, a prince of the damned, so it makes in an ideal villain. Wild Hunt According to tradition and eyewitness accounts, the wild hunt abducts people, forcing them to join its mad gallopade in the sky. Its harvest is especially rich just before or during a great war, like a few years ago in Novigrad, when over 20 people went missing without a trace after the wild hunt passed. Some of the abductees managed to escape the cavalcade back into the world of the living, but the stories they told were so extraordinary that were they were always considered insane. One of the, insa uh, one of the insane asylums one of the asa insane asylum's patients came to have been abducted by the wild hunt and taken to a world where unicorns saunter about lush elven gardens. When he finally succeeded in escaping the hunt's grasp, he returned to this world only to find that his children had aged and died. So many years had passed. Stories of the wild hunt do not appear in dwarven and elven cultures. It is quite interesting, for the elder races must have faced the hunt long before humans did. As it seems, the dwarves ignore everything on mutual terms, where the elves are mysteriously silent on that subject. According to the Nordlings, the wild hunt is a procession, or rather a cavalcade of skeletal horsemen. They rush across the sky on the bony remains of steeds. Clad in rusty remains of armor, they wear jagged swords at their waists. Like comets, the wild hunt is an omen of, omen of, omen of war, which has been confirmed beyond all doubt. The spectral cavalcade ventures out in search of, the of victims every several years, but its harvest was never as rich as just before the last war with Nilfgaard, when over 20 souls went missing in Novigrad alone after the hunt passed through. Curiously, elven and dwarven legends make not the slightest mention of the wild hunt. Ada King Folter's daughter had been cursed even before leaving her mother's womb and turned into a striga as a child. The jack toothed princess had long terrorized Vizima until Geralt lifted the curse. It returned after a few years, but the witcher managed to lift it a second time. Later, Ada became the wife of Radovid, Radovid V, King of Redania. <laughs>